Dude, this yeah. fall versus last fall, two polar opposites. I, I would, the second I knew, even if it was a 60 day out close, I would lock them because I knew the weight rates were trending. I mean, we hit 8% last November. There are 87% of the people that qualify for those down payment assistance programs. So what I would encourage is, is in everything, dig beyond the headlines and, and understand what your individual situation would allow, right? I think we were talking a little bit about that baby boomer population. Yeah, right? sure. Uh, I've been selling real estate for 13 years with Classified Realty Group. Uh, a couple of years ago, we created Quinlan Homes, our own team at Classified Realty Group. And the last couple of years, we've added two additional agents. So we're up to four agents now. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Life Beyond Boxes podcast. My name is Marion. I'm uh, one of the hosts. I got uh, Victor Shaves with me. How's it going, Victor? I'm good. It's How's been a while. Doing? I know. A month? We got Matt Quillen, third time on the podcast. Hi. And Ed, welcome uh, as a, I guess, first, first time guest. Yeah. First, uh, first time uh, Thanks, official guys. guest. Pleasure being here. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thanks for um, coming on. So a couple, a couple of things that uh, we're gonna, well, we're gonna have a bunch of questions for you, obviously. <laughs> some of them uh, from a lot of the blogs and a couple other questions that we got from uh, some of our customers. And so this would be the first time that you probably lead the whole outline of the show and uh, and whatnot, so we can uh, get a little more on on topic. <laughs> I tend to jump around questions and whatnot, but before we dive in, Matt. A lot of the listeners and a lot of people that watch uh, our content already know who you are sure. and what you do, but maybe let's give people a one minute yeah. background of how did you get in real estate and, and uh, why, and then we'll, we'll go to uh, Ed. Sure. Uh, I've been selling real estate for 13 years with Classified Realty Group. Uh, a couple of years ago, we created Quinlan Homes, our own team at Classified Realty Group. And the last couple of years, we've added two additional agents, so we're up to four agents now. Uh, we've had a great success. Well, the market has certainly been difficult and whatnot. We've sold over 30 houses each year for the last three or four years. This year we're over 36. So it's it's been a, another exciting year and it's it's been good. So and we're just uh, going into Q4. We still got we still we just put a new listing on this weekend and. The traffic's been incredible. If I missed your phone call while I'm here, I apologize. <laughs> I called right back. Awesome. And uh, what about you? How yeah. uh, how'd you get into? Uh, yeah, so I'm a mortgage loan officer, licensed in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, and Florida. Um, I've been I got in the business in 2000. Uh, after I bought my house, actually, my mortgage loan officer made helped make it one of the happiest days of my life. And I was self-employed at that time. And if you guys know um, how self-employed it, it's it's can be it's tricky. Different. I work with a lot of self-employed people that mm -hmm. look to buy homes, and it's it's a lot. It, it's a lot more of a process than it is if you're a salary uh, W-2 income. So again, it was a, it was a great day and like just really kind of found like an opportunity. I said, hey, you know what? I saw my uh, my boss was looking for to grow his team and I jumped on in 2017 and um, kind of learned under his as, him as a mentor. Uh, his name is Mike Comerford. So he uh, had a mortgage, mortgage broker company um, and we actually merged with CMG Home Loans in 2022, uh, we're going to, uh, to as a nationwide lender. Uh, a lot of consolidation in the mortgage business the last couple of years, as you know, interest rates, and um, we had definitely seen uh, some some changes with people moving all over the place. We ended up with CMG Home Loans, and couldn't be happier. It's a great company, really fit uh, like the, the same culture that we had grown with Premier Mortgage, a mortgage broker, and yeah, so that's really the background in, in mortgages for myself. Uh, definitely. It's, uh, it's, it's great to be a part of people's very special days when it comes to buying their first home. I love first working with first time home buyers, investors. It's a lot of fun. Um, really kind of see opportunities and um, but being able to offer some products that can really help uh, solve solutions for uh, what they're looking for. Love awesome. it. Yeah. Awesome, actually. Now I'm going to have a bunch of uh, selfless, uh, <laughs> selfless, que selfish questions for you. Yeah, oh, I'm not going to leave the yeah. story anymore. <laughs> I, I remember. Um, I think it was 2018 when I bought um, this property and I remember I called um, an officer and the first question that he asked was, all right, you W2 or you um, I'm like employed, been self-employed for uh, about three and a half years. All right, so we're going to have some numbers to play with. <laughs> and then from there, of course, yeah. you know, do. but uh, I'll let you take on because if not, I'm really going <laughs> to. Thank you for the introduction. First of all, Ed Whitehouse. Perfect name for a loan officer. She nailed it. Uh, so let's jump right into it. So in the most basic way, describe 
what interest rates are and what typically you know if they rise or if they lower so it's just kind of a, kind of exactly what they are for our listeners at home that might not know yet yeah. everyone's probably really confused right now yeah. the fed rate being you know expecting things because they don't have the education or knowledge of i've definitely gotten a lot of phone calls uh yeah. since a big anticipated uh fed pivot yeah yeah the fact that everyone's been talking about for like maybe the last 18 months yeah, do we have an actual number like how much you know, yeah like you all yeah, kinds of and there's of a lot of confusion too because the Fed fund rate, which is what they control, it's overnight banking lending um, for for banks overnight. So it's not a mortgage interest rate. Yeah, yeah. So they they hear in the news, they see the headlines that the Fed fund rate dropped uh, 50 basis points, so half a percent cut. So I know mortgage rates cut half a percent. Awesome, <laughs> like overnight. But you know what's interesting is that mortgage interest rates had dropped prior to the Fed fund cut in September. We saw a huge dip in early August. It was awesome, and at that point, because they um, they use data, and they're gonna they're gonna look at probabilities, and at, at, so what they there's obviously plenty of data to look at what the next Fed meetings and and what they're gonna do um, forecasted. They're gonna look at that. It's like looking at the weather for the for the weekend. What yeah, they yeah. planned for it. So they had jumped a, they had jumped a gun. Actually, the the rates actually came down substantially in early August before the Fed cut. And I was just telling Matt. So I was looking at my phone. I got a alert today, and I'm like, I, I got a little upset because I've been seeing mortgage interest rates like just cut a little bit since that Fed Fed cut on the 18th of September. Um, we haven't seen any dip in mortgage rates. We've actually seen them going up about like 20 points since because as we know, there's a lot of volatility at the moment. Uh, we're out, we're inside 60 days of the election too, which definitely plays a factor. So there's, there's just a lot that's, there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment um, right. and markets don't really like the uncertainty. They like, they like bets, yeah. you know, so. Well, it's funny, we were outside, you know, waiting to get in here and start filming. And he, you know, looked and he goes, oh, his just rates went up a little bit. Like, oh shit, it happens that quick? <laughs> I, I had no idea, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, I mean, mortgage interest rates, um, like, well, they change every day. So people, they'll get quoted on a rate and, you know, block until we actually have an idea of when, uh, when they're going to be going, when the closing day is. So, you know, great, but we're going to also tell them that these can change multiple times a day, depending on markets, reports that come out, and especially job data, which has been super sensitive, like, uh, as we know, unemployment tick up this year, um, and all the, in, uh, the rates uh, that usually see, like, uh, well, and, um, GDP, of course, and also like uh, CPI, you all know, the big ones. So anytime these reports come out, we'll see like a, a jump in, in uh, and ho hopefully we see them come down a little yeah. bit more. That's why we saw it come down quite a bit in August too, is we had a really good CPI reading. So that day, like we saw mortgage rates really- What's CPI stand for? Uh, consumer price index. Yeah, so that's looking at like how we're bending mm -hmm. and that, that obviously affects the inflation and, and anticipated inflation going forward. Gotcha. Yeah. The incredible fluctuate, fluctuation in those mortgage rates, especially over the last year, where there there's so much movement, there's mm -hmm. not a lot of consistency, is is really important to understand whether you're on the listing side or the buy side too. Uh, from my perspective, if I get a pre-approval at an offer deadline and it and it yeah, there are ninety days. Yeah, pre approval ninety yep. days. Yeah. What nine in the last ninety days? We have yeah. no idea. Yeah. Right. And so when my buyers are preparing to buy a house they're calling and they're talking to them on friday afternoon and understanding what's happening right now and making their offer based on what's happening right now right they, maybe the lender gave a pre-approval letter that was maybe at the top of their limit and the rates went up over the 90-day period and now they don't actually qualify yeah. but they still have a valid pre-approval letter and so that, that, that was my next question actually what happens to that pre-approval letter Right. I mean, the approval letter is, is just a pre-approval letter. It says he did his homework and at that time of the issuing the pre-approval, these people qualify for that. That That's sure, not sure. a guarantee for loan. That not, that's not a commitment letter, right? Yeah. That's yeah. not, yes, we've done all of our homework and you're definitely doing it. So when we're looking at the pre-approval letter, it's nice. It's probably super annoying for you, <laughs> but I have the clients call in it's going to write up a pre-approval letter for that particular house and that particular price on that particular day at the top of the thing. And then that listing agent, that seller has confidence that these people are actually qualified yeah. for that. So. That's, uh, that was my next question actually, regarding the pre-approval letter in terms of like, how does that even lock you in? But you, you already 
Yes, it Sorry. doesn't actually, right? In my head, I'm like, all right. I mean, it's a good point, because you, you've talked about, obviously, rates are always fluctuating, and you say, you know, about the news that rates were coming down, but they've already been down as far as a mortgage stance goes. So for people listening at home, obviously, I know it varies, but I think everyone still thinks that rates are upwards of 7% and higher and stuff like that. What are the rates trending at now? Where do we think they're going to go? And by, right so, now, for people listening in the future, I'm sorry, sorry, that is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to get it as fast as possible. Yeah. So, I mean, it, the program, of course, because a lot of people might not realize, like, you're going to, there's so many factors. Um, and it comes to getting an interest rate, of course, people's FICO score, down payment scenario, if it's a second home investment property. But if we're talking about a 30 year fixed conventional uh, for a primary, Great credit, uh, good down payment, like 20% down. Uh, we're talking about right around six, six and an eighth, maybe around six, uh, six and a quarter, somewhere around there right now, depending on uh, yep. the day. But yeah, that, that's where ballpark rate it is at the moment. And do they project rates getting much better? I mean, our whole idea on anyone yeah. is getting obviously interest rates down. Do they think it's going to go much, you know, what's the timeline roughly? What are the experts kind of thinking of? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's like when the Fed does pivot, they don't really kind of look back. So we, we're, we're now entering like a phase where it's going to be um, easier borrowing, shall we say, not just mortgages, but just, I mean, we're going to see the, the, the glory days of 2020, 2021, when they cut the Fed fund rate to 0% and mortgage rates were at like 2.5%, you know, obviously because of a global pandemic stimulating the economy, but we're definitely going to be easing than what we've seen the last couple uh, the last few years, I'd say, um, when it, what they, the, the phase was called QT, so quantitative tightening. So they're actually retracting money out of the economy, the Fed, um, monthly, and also r raising interest rates to obviously try to reduce spending and borrowing. So now the pivot is now created a uh, uh, swing momentum towards the QE, so quantitative easing, um, and actually going to mean like lower rates, easing down, trending lower, um, not all at once, because then now we create a lot of like hyperinflation too soon. So we're, they're gonna be easing down. It's predicted that we'll be seeing two more Fed cuts um, this year, uh, probably around 25 basis points per meeting. So there's a meeting in November, meeting in December. Um, so we'll see, we'll see where that's at right now. The Fed fund rates now went from five and five, five and a half to five percent. Mm -hmm. Think of in the year about four and a half percent. Oh, um, really? yeah, yep. But so when it comes to mortgages, though, we're not even, you know, the Fed fund rate looking at how we're trending. Um, but we're, we're actually looking at uh, uh, the 10 year treasury because actually what's gonna, there's, there's a, a stronger correlation to the 10 year treasury note than it is uh, the Fed fund rate. Um, if you ever look at historic data, take a look like the last 30 years, um, you'll see the 30 year Fed and the 10 year treasury and they, they move in, in unison together. Right. Um, and the, the, the mortgage rate actually, um, it has like a higher, higher rate, they, they, they move in line. So that's really what you want to monitor on a, on a daily basis of where that 10 years going. How's that looking? It's, it's, it's better. So all last, uh, like up until August, it was sitting over 4%. Mm -hmm. Um, and now it's about three, 3.8. Well, trending in the right direction. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. from my, from my understanding of what you uh, just said, it's pretty much a manipulation quote unquote of the economy when it comes to the right like the I, it's, yeah it is or, yeah, absolutely at the fed level right yeah. the, they're manipulating they they like that is, money when you need yeah. to when you want to allow borrowing and then retracting money yeah. when you want to kind of stop that and so, there's a fact to it too like it's not gonna, yeah, you it's not don't gonna see happen. it instant but like you know kind of like the inflation reports like inflation still going up and as they were as they were uh, rate, raising rates for uh, you know last two years there's inflation going up and up but at some point it, it, there's kind of like this like a delay where um you're lag, shall we say yeah. and we'll see that too now that they're cutting it's going to take some time for the economy to see that stimulus that you know that they're manipulating right now um so it, we'll probably see them maybe closer to like right after the holidays new year we'll start to see yeah, it was leading into 2025. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like hopefully so, like some more people um, and the, you know the better rates overall when it comes to like credit cards, auto loans, and mortgages. Is that does that apply the refinance process too in terms of like how yeah, kind of people been that's pretty much people been praying this for <laughs> two years now. You know, I've, I've been getting calls. What can I refinance? What can I yeah. refinance? And so I mean, yeah, we we had a, a, a talked to any banker um, loan officer. You know, their their pipelines for finances that we haven't seen. 
seen in like two years. Yeah. You know, it's been all purchase heavy. Starting like because again, people it, just seeing what we kind of seen uh, from in July to about like just. Uh, under six and a half now, yeah. you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, some dollars in, in difference and that they're, that they're going to be able to save. And obviously there's closing costs too, that people have to kind of weigh out on refinancing. So it makes sense. Some people might be holding off to, uh, because it, again, if rates are lower, that means that the rates will be a little bit lower in maybe a couple more months too. And yeah. people want to like lock in a no, new rate, see rates, rates fall even lower. I would pay more closing costs yeah. to get that lower rate. Yeah. Um, lenders do offer, I mean, I said CMG offered a, a refinance program. We, we came up with it two years ago when we knew there was no refinances that were going to be happening. So we, to incentivize people to keep buying with, you know, higher rates and, you know, cost of homes, uh, had offered, we have our program and it's still, people are still eligible. Anyone that closes a loan with CMG, we take care of their lender fees um, and a thousand dollar credit for financing. So this has helped out a lot of my buyers personally because there's no closing costs and they're eligible to do it for the next five years. And um, and it's it's every uh, every payments they're allowed to do as long as their rate's about a half a percent lower. So yeah, I've awesome. been able to refinance my entire pipeline for the last two years and they, they, no one had to come out of pocket for any closing costs for these on it. That's awesome. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. And so when it comes to, you know, you get notified again, based on when these things are happening, going back to that pre-approval uh, process. So let's assume I get a pre-approval on Monday. Call Matt, he shows me a bunch of houses. And then Friday, do you get notified? Because, you know, Friday, end of the week, notified if Monday something will happen in terms of the rate. Like, for example, let's say I have houses that I'm debating between is that a thing? Like, would you be able to say when they, this is not wish. I mean, again, right now, trends are existent in every aspect of buying a house, yeah. but there are things that you're following on a regular basis that can say, Hey, you need to make it like, like today, not matters, Monday. <laughs> right? Like if you have a, if you're in a pre-approval status and you don't have a house under contract yet, you're not, you're not going to lock in a rate at it ever. So it doesn't really affect things. When you're going into getting an offer accepted, that's when you're really going to want to kind of nail down that's what you're that's thinking about, too. right? And then even then, Ed might say, "Listen, I'm I'm following the trends. They're not guaranteed to follow this way, but if this happens, this is generally what happens next." And he can say, "Why don't we wait, right? Mm. We know that in the next month there's going to be this meeting. Here's the risk associated with waiting a couple weeks to lock." Or That's he might point. say, "There's too much risk, and you should you should probably lock today." Yeah, yeah, that's a good. Uh, this yeah. fall versus last fall, two polar opposites. I I would, the second I knew, even if it was a 60 day out close, I would lock them because I knew the way th rates were trending. I mean, we hit eight percent last November. Yeah. If I waited two weeks, that rate probably would have went like another you know half a quarter to half percent like last fall yeah. because we just kept seeing that trending up. So this fall completely different because we're anticipating more cuts towards the end of the year. So it's yeah. like. Why, why lock at 60 days when it's actually, it's less of a closing cost for that rate at 21 days or 10 days, you know? So we, we feel safer. We have to monitor the markets daily. Again, when we when we talk about those inflation and employment reports, like we know when those are coming and know, like they'll, they'll kind of give us a consensus, consensus of what we're predicting. So we'll kind of have an idea if we should lock prior, if we should let, we should float in and, and take advantage of the lower rate after that data comes out. Well, it goes into like, you know, what we always talk about. What's the uncle's name that we always talk Uncle about? Bob. Uncle Bob, a loan <laughs> provider, a loan officer. Like you have to reach out to the professionals that do this for a living, that know exactly what they're doing, especially with something as crazy as mortgage rates and rates in general. Yeah. You have to reach out to see where everything's at. You can't just listen to the news to see what, because if it's the news, yeah. rates are going down, great time for everything, you know, everything's trending up. Don't listen you know? to me. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm not going to mortgages or anything like that. I know enough. Even though we always ask you on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I always know enough about the general trends, right? It's like going yeah. to the doctor. You yeah. go to your primary care physician to make sure everything looks like it's supposed to look. But as soon as there's any question about what it's supposed to look to, you need to go yeah, talk to, to the, the specialist, yeah. right? And so I, I think that's really important to, to follow because even with this whole Fed rate, like you scroll through social media and it's like celebrating and cheering. And then you look, you see a few of your really trusted mortgage lenders being like, slow down. Yeah. This probably isn't to do anything. 
and it doesn't mean if something happens it's good. In fact, it went up a quarter of a point the same day the Fed rate went down. Yeah, yeah. Can you believe that Matt is actually not taking advice from TikTok? <laughs> so I mean, break it down on you know on the ground as real estate goes and real estate agent mm -hmm. and broker goes. What are you seeing out there? Are you seeing an influx in calls and people looking to buy now because they think rates are going to be so much lower and then you got to bring them back to, you know, kind of neutral? Yeah. What do you think last year, talking about the difference between last mm -hmm. year and this year, last year we had this, this like hopeful doom and gloom mm -hmm. where people were like, oh my gosh, the rates are so outrageous, but at least the home prices will come down. And so they were... They were kind of, so they weren't, they weren't in a rush at that point. Cause like, we're going to let prices come down. Then the end of the year round. And in fact, prices increased last year. They didn't go down yeah. because it's a supply and demand thing, not a cost thing. Um, people need somewhere to live, but the, the opposite at the beginning of this year where buyers were seeing the rates coming down, they realized the prices didn't go up last year. I mean, excuse me, the, the prices in last year. And so they think, well, if the rates come down, you're more likely to see prices go up this year. And so there was a little bit of a frenzy at the beginning of the year to get out there and secure something before the rates did actually come down. Yeah. And again, I, we've talked about this on the show before, we're in a supply and demand situation, right? Yeah. We're not in the, in the Midwest cool. where you can just build a thousand new houses. We don't have places to build houses right now that are going to help out with the supply and demand. Unless you go in two hours away from- But even from those, like, we used to more, see, yeah. we used to see a substantial difference in the home prices between Mass and New Hampshire. And I think as you get higher in the price points, you'll see a substantial difference in the kind of house you're getting for those bigger price points. Um, like uh, we sold a house last year, the base price of a new construction house was seven sixty five. dollars yeah. They put a bunch of upgrades and, and it went up, but that was in Hudson, New Hampshire for a beautiful new construction house on a, on a great lot in a cul-de-sac. You're not getting that in Massachusetts, right? Yeah. But if you're looking at those houses under $600,000, they are pretty, they're pretty yeah. even yeah. because yeah. those first time entry level buyers, they, they have to find somewhere to live and they're going to go as far as they have to go until they find to that. Afford, yeah, to be able to afford that. Now, does the rate dropping help new builds at all? New construction? having more in the inventory or is it pretty much? I mean, we, we're still underbuilt right now. We use anything we can, but yeah. the, the, it's gonna take a long time for them to fix any kind of inventory issue. Um, and I know Matt, you had mentioned like the other day, um, like we, we should definitely be incentivizing more tax credits and, and figure out solutions there to, to get more supply um, or figure out more creative solutions. Um, but, uh, Massachusetts is actually working towards, they just, uh, they just passed the Affordable Homes Act. It's gonna be in place um, they're starting now, but there's some, some new rules on ADUs, which I think is a key solution for some accessory dwelling units. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Formerly known as in-laws. In-laws, you were only allowed to have relatives living in your house and there are all kinds of rules and stipulations. Yeah. Tons of towns like them because it kind of changed the demographic of, of the kink and in-law where you have this extra apartment, right? And maybe your grandparents or somebody's moving in there, but it's, it's not a what happens when that person doesn't need that space any longer. Now you've got this multifamily home without family living in it. That was the in-law. That's why towns have been kind of against it in the past, but we're where we don't have lands to build on. Yeah. And so creating, yeah, you know, offering creative solutions to that, you've got don't want to downsize because the cost of their house that they're living in, it, it's going to be kind of potentially could be the same as one of these new condo complexes or, or whatnot. And, yeah. and they like their house and they don't, they don't feel the need to move, but maybe the kids can buy the parents' house and the parents can move into the ADU yeah. in the backyard. Yeah. And, you know, it, it makes everybody happy there. Yeah. Uh, rental income for investors too, that people are looking at these options with these, these ADUs and um, it's actually going to help increase the property for people putting these on uh, because they can rent them out and get more cash flow for the, in their pocket monthly mm -hmm. that that i mean i i did it right i'm in law mm -hmm. and forgot about the fact that now using the language of accessory dwelling unit allows for that where in-laws did not historically allow for rentals and yeah. things like that yeah i mean i think you have to ways to you know move units and again get the big sell off their assets and go into a new place because it's tough i mean 
you can downsize because you have to, but if you don't have to downsize, why are you gonna buy a condo now at a higher interest rate and they're paying probably the same, if not more, than you're paying for the three to four bedroom house. There's no incentive for, you know, baby boomers or the older generation to move out of their house. And I so, think that's the that's the headline that I think we all get sucked into mm -hmm. and caught up in is like it doesn't make sense. There are scenarios where it doesn't make sense, but without actually knowing the individual situation and the individual's footy, right? They might, they might be getting such a small mortgage because of the amount of cash that they have built up in their house. They yeah. might be able to buy their new place and not have a mortgage, right? And then you got to do the math, like you get that worksheet. How much does your landscape cost? How much is your snow removal? How much does? How much? How much? How much? How much? right and some of these houses those bills are pretty hefty and so if you divide those up by 12 months and then you look at the condo fee on a new construction you know detached home or something like that they might be closer than people think and so what i would encourage is is in everything dig beyond the headlines and, and understand what your individual situation would allow right i think we were talking a little bit about that baby boomer population, yeah. they, they own 43% of the the housing right now. Yeah. And they're at that, they're at that age. They're they're turning to that 65 age. And listen to a KCM podcast and the, uh, the gentleman was talking about your understanding your perception of where people are at. So they have, you think 65, they're retired, they're getting older. 65 is not very old right yeah. now. Yeah. Everyone, there are a lot of healthy 65 year old people who are not afraid of taking care of their house yeah. and they're not motivated to be done. So that's not their motivation. But there are 65 year old people who own a big house with a ton of equity and maybe it's, maybe it's not a need Maybe it's a want. Maybe they actually want to go into one of these active adult 55 yeah. and all the communities that are kind of like college without any schoolwork. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's a want. And now if we look at their whole scenario and we break down how much equity they have and they, they do the math, they may actually be able to accomplish that, that goal, that dream of moving into that new construction home. Yeah. And so I guess I would encourage her in that, that phase of life, Let's have a conversation. Yeah. Let's look at what you could do, you know, and why you want to do it. Kids went to college somewhere else and they planted roots in another part of the country. Like that's a, that's a pretty big yeah. motivator. I want to be near my kids. My kids aren't coming back. They met yeah. someone in college that was, um, you know, from a different part of the country and and that family won the won the rock paper scissors <laughs> shoot right well that's what we see that a lot so i mean obviously we have the boston and the branch so we move people constantly to boston and florida used to be a lot more snowbirds but now we're seeing like random like we've done more moves to this year than i ever thought people wanted to live in pennsylvania so but it's always moving closer to their kids so and it's always when they start having grandkids right the yeah. grandkids become one or two they're sick of us but they're excited about <laughs> exactly <laughs> now facetime just quite ain't doing it so they have to move over there so that's a ton you know that we've been seeing and you know, in one of our groups um we were talking kind of brainstorming you know again how to fix the inventory any of us have any of the yeah. answers but uh one of them made a good point it's like if the baby boomer generation has sort of tax cut tax advantage to sell their houses yeah. um you have to make the baby think like over the, whatever they say the next two decades is going to be the biggest wealth transfer and it's like 84 trillion dollars or something like that mm -hmm. that's going to go from baby boomers to the next generation now to kind of speed up the process you have to get some sort of incentive to sell outside of grandkids and stuff like that it's interesting i mean there, there are plenty of opportunities for assistance buying side mm -hmm. but that's limited in, in its in its productivity right because you were still not getting at the issue isn't necessarily that they don't have money to buy the house it's that they can't afford the cost of the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's because there's well, not the cost inventory, yeah. right? Yeah. And so giving buyers more money is just giving the buyers more money to give the sellers. It's yeah, yeah, not, yeah. it's yeah. not, it's not bringing down the goal. Yeah. It's bringing up yeah. the, the cost. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, it's it, I, obviously I'm not an economic person. So I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't ever study that. And I really don't know. I, I send people for the head, but. <laughs> 
But that was uh, right before this, you brought up the investors uh, kind of side. Uh, one question that I uh, remember uh, brought up the point um, in a different episode, because you said you work with a lot of business owners, right? So the yeah. qualifications are a lot different. I still to this day do not understand why uh, banks prefer W-2s versus self-employment. Consistency. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But even, even when you get the consistency of being self-employed for uh, five, six years, when you put that person against another W-2 that it's five, the same five, six years, like, or, or maybe another word, the question would be, what are the things that self-employed uh, people can maybe prepare to, or, or, or what are the things that yeah. you can do? Um, be responsible business owners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and talk to, a, talk to a lender before really going and looking at homes and get, getting your heart set on a, on a home. You need to work the numbers up and have a plan. It took, took me six months to be able to do it. Like yeah. I went, I, I found a home that I was really interested in and actually had a rent to own situation workout. So I was lucky it was 2016 different market than what we're seeing right now. Um, We've written up a lot of those rent to own contracts and I don't think anyone's ever going to sign them. So that's oh yeah. Cool. Yeah, it was, um, so it was, uh, I got to actually leave the house and work on the whole, like getting myself qualified while I was renting and closed on uh, April following year. Um, was so it least about one of the least buy type yeah. of? Um, yeah, don't call me on those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. We can talk. <laughs> um, but like, it's it's definitely a good idea to, to do a loan officer as early as possible because there, we're here as an aid because like we 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 know that it's kind of be a process. Uh, we don't expect to talk to someone and they're going to buy a house the next day and we're going to close on it like you know a week or anything like that. Buyers, I'm still working with from like two years ago and. It's you know the whole process and, and especially the frustration on the on the self-employed side because self-employed you're so motivated and um, incentivized to you know use the the right on your business and, and uh, you know the, the tax situation and all that so um, but you've got to be qualified to make that's where yeah, it hurts. a little yeah. more yeah. Yeah. a little more yeah. income yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. so I, I you know you, you got to find a, figure out like when is the right time to do it so I've been um, you know having talking to, talking to a lender to advise. You know, um, and at the same time too, have like that real realtor like it lined up too, so that like go when when the when you're ready to do that. And a lot of the time for self-employed people, I'd, I'd say like talk to them before the new year because you it's a window right after the right after that that year ends where until you file your taxes, you might have some flexibility to be able to narrow talk to your accountant, CPA, and see what you can do to qualify for a certain amount. Keep it. Um, so, you know, talk, talk, work with your lender and DPA, the numbers and what would make sense on, you know, for your taxes, but yeah. at the same time, you have to qualify. Um, before we kind of continue on the outline, um, yes, uh, bring, uh, not necessarily this question, but asking for a quote unquote. <laughs> so let's assume, let's assume um, somebody did their um, due diligence, whatever, bought properties before, and then um, let's say, you know, four or five years later in other words last year i guess it was either 2022 or 2021 i can't remember exactly and it was more of a refinance question but it was right in the middle when so after covid it was like a, a one-year part where the company i don't know like we had a little bit of a of like 10 percent compared to all previous years mm -hmm. right and then the bank really looked at that and said well because of that reason um you don't qualify, unfortunately, at this moment because it's, it shows a decline in, yeah. um, even though the, yeah. my personal income did not get affected, you know, my yearly income did not get affected at all. Company as a whole did show like a 10% uh, kind of downfall. So yeah. I'm wondering, is there something that maybe I was missing? Like, I don't know, not necessarily, again, disclaimer, this is not a uh, financial advice and none of that. <laughs> we should yeah. put this, this should make sure we put this, uh, you have it listed in the, um, in the beginning of the show. But um, mm -hmm. is that, I was not aware that that's a thing. Yeah, so <laughs> like when you're getting qualified and purchasing a home, um, the underwriter is looking at like multiple things, but they're looking at your history um, and likelihood of, of your future income. So that's W-2 salaries like, you know, it's almost like, okay, this is the per that person doing this year, it's future income. Um, so it's a lot more, it's it's a lot less risky to a, to a lender or a bank than versus, you know, self-employed, right? You know, we're so, we're so to markets and economy and everything that happens. So like we, we have our up years, we have our tears, and that's why 
traditionally for, for self-employed, we're using an average, usually a two-year average, unless you've been self-employed for longer than five years, then technically, we could, you know, going fan year uh, guidelines, we could actually go one year, uh, your, your previous year tax returns and, and your net income there versus a two-year average, if you've been self-employed oh, longer than that. five, yeah. Fannie and Freddie. Yep. It was actually similar. Yeah, so yeah, so you could technically My qualify. Friend, yeah. Friends here, you know, in your business. <laughs> you can technically qualify for, um, with just using your previous tax returns instead of having to use the two year average because the, you know, usually self employed, we're seeing like increase, 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 all back the two years. It's like, well, I wait, I made more now than I did like two years ago. It's things and, that have to use that average. two year average is only in an ascending income right whereas that's exactly in your what situation happened. if yeah. they, if they averaged the them it would have been good yeah. but they they saw the down so they only last is that correct yeah like they won't use the average of the two they'll just the lower of the two but which is crazy reasonable. is my again my personal like at the end of the year um personal income not get affected because i knew if i will declare less um it will i will come to a point where i'm gonna be um Getting a problem, yeah. but then they still looked at uh, returns and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's what the income is coming from. Yeah, and there are programs for self-employed, um, like portfolio loans, um, non-QM, don't follow the guidelines, and sometimes those are the better solution than going the conventional right. because of because of your circumstance and like how you pay yourself. You know, so it's good to talk to a lender and other options outside of conventional that might be might be more beneficial to you. Um, that, that's another reason. It's free to use a lender. They're not gonna, they don't, they don't charge by the hour. You know, we don't get paid yeah. until it closes. So find as many great solutions that are gonna work out that you're gonna, you know, know about and see what's gonna work best for you. I guess what uh, what was um, kind of a little bit crazy was the how was the company um, sell at the beginning of the year? Was it the beginning of the year? Yeah. yeah. Um, it was only one bank, and that was a company. It was only one bank like three years ago that uh, allowed me to do a HELOC on investment property. And they said, all right, I'm just gonna try with the same bank. And I don't know if that was a mistake of mine or whatever, or maybe it was too short of a period when uh, when I tried that. But anyway, that was just a quick... Um... Oh, and then the last question, and then we can move on. <laughs> so self-employed, right? But you can still be W2 paid in your own company. Yeah. Does that make a difference? In Because for example, that I'm getting paid now is W2 and plus the difference that I need to make at the end of the year. Um, yeah, so... Um, if you've been self self employed and self this way for like over five years, we technically need to see the business returns as long as you know you've been doing it for a time frame. Um, but it's like more recent, then we do need to take a look at the business returns too and make sure there's no losses coming out of the business returns because you're paying yourself the W two income. Gotcha. Yeah. That, no, this was more of a moving forward type mm -hmm. of uh, kind of yeah. strategy um, it's question. Interesting. I mean, I don't know. Go down a rabbit hole. Has to go down the rabbit hole if we don't want to, but. You're not looking at the business losses for his W two employees, no, right? No, exactly. It's just an interesting. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah that's so yeah. interesting. But but the amount I'm getting on my W two might not be enough, so that's why I don't know if, if that's yeah. you know what I mean. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's just, as long just as I kind of have. But yeah, that's a good point. Your employees don't go through the same you know yeah. scrutiny that you do, even if you're getting sent by the same house. Well, they have the security yeah. of you as the owner of the company running the company and then the owner of the company that's doing the work to run it doesn't have that same security yeah, so right yeah. it's i mean i i get in aspect it's harder to get from a job than it is to run a business Dude, it's to get fired from your own company yeah. Yeah. it should be you're boosting the economy well, it should be easier for you to get it because you are controlling you know your interest more but yeah. you know it's interesting in the ball the other just of that that made me think of how how you need the two years as a self-employed borrower you can get a mortgage with an offer letter and a paycheck if you are a W-2 or a salary position. It's really interesting. And I think people don't understand that, especially we just had a whole group of college graduates graduate and enter the, enter the workforce. And they just assume, I just graduated. I just started my job. I can't buy a house. That's, that's not true. Yeah. You don't have to go spend $3,000 on rent you might want to, and by all means, go have fun and do your thing. But if you are, my sister bought her first house when she was 22 years old, and she was in training in Georgia at the time, not even anywhere near her, never seen a house. I saw one I thought she might like and put an offer in for her. She, she so didn't what did like the it. Bank look she had, uh, she got an offer letter from 
I think she was with Ernst and Young at the time, and that offer letter. What can you tell about? Yeah. So exactly. Sorry. So like your offer letter. What what they're going to get. I mean, yeah. you could probably speak more to, to mm -hmm. that process. Yeah, exactly it. Um, and it has to say they're gonna start you off before you close on the house. So it has to have your start date, and as long as your close date's after you start your job, you can use that uh, offer letter to qualify for a mortgage and get the process started. So yeah. what happens with two years of W-2s? It goes out the window? No, that, that <laughs> yeah. W, it's the 1099s for the self-employed. Yeah. And the, w the W two employee doesn't so have to. You see, work. Yeah, and, right, right. Take the, take your complicated W two and ten ninety nine out, and just go to the salaried W two person that yeah. doesn't have any self. We would need if it was they were coming from um, graduating school, their college. We would just need their uh, their transcripts, their school transcripts, and, and that'd be their their work history. That's all well, we need to. And that would show their them. career path, right? So, like, mm -hmm. if they were in an education program they could and say, hey, I just completed my education degree. I have a teaching contract yeah. offered to me and now I can purchase a condo with that. Yeah, we try so to, if I make myself an employment letter, same. A different position. My God, that's the craziest <laughs> thing I've heard to try to qualify. <laughs> I can't think of anything. <laughs> to that point, as creative, as, as, creative as you want to be, it's not going to fly. <laughs> <laughs> so just talk to the lawyers like that. Give them all the real information and then... I'll probably just have my wife and write their letter. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, man, I'm just going to go over for her salon. I can see you doing eyelashes. <laughs> awesome, guys. So get back a little bit more on track. Um, the election. So obviously, no matter who anyone is for, yeah. that's 100% what this podcast is not about. Not but as far <laughs> as the election goes, and not just this election, but every election that has been there before, how does that react? How do people reacting to rates around the time? Is the buying and selling process working? I mean, I feel like a lot of people are where the election is going. So are people that's, waiting? Which, you know, you know, in other words, what are you asking is, how am I to manipulate the entire uh, economic <laughs> system to regardless in one way? And this, this, this is sincere that it, regardless of who is going to win, who people think is going to win, regardless of any of that, if you look historically at um, election years, sales have dropped between October and November. People are we'll waiting. People are waiting to find out what's happening. Right? They're uncertain on the future, and they they're gonna just they're not not buying. They're just not yet buying until yeah. they get a little bit more stability. Uh, interest rates, this might go down that little kind of, you know, what's going on with the manipulation stuff, whatever, we're not going there. Um, but historically, I think two years since 1980 uh, have gone down in election years. Um, I'm not sure if that's, I yeah. think that's what you've as well. Yeah. Um, and the other interesting historical fact would be year after elections home prices have risen uh, not the rates just the price the, the home prices. prices have gone up the year after an election every year i think except for i think there were two years most recently oh eight and i guess it's exactly that corresponded with rates going down the more demand. people buying and then obviously it's flooding yeah, the market i mean so i think up. i think there's probably well you got years of certainty yeah right sure, like you know people. you know what the next few years are eight, so that, that might be a little bad. bit. Yeah. Right. It doesn't, yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter if you like it or don't. It, yeah. you, it, you know. it's, yeah. it's a so confidence level, well. right? Those are those are three sort of to to our conversation earlier about trends and things like that. It's really hard right now to follow historical trends because we're in kind of uncharted territory. Uh, you know, I, I keep going all the and May tenth. What was that? That was that was that was a year and a half ago. The May tenth date. Like everyone's like May tenth, May tenth. Watch May tenth. That's going to be the date. The rates come back down and the market's going to get all better. And here we are, a year and a half later, and May tenth. So. Next May tenth. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Like, but it's just if you followed all the historical data, then then May tenth should have been an important date, but it wasn't. It wasn't, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's also a reason why we're seeing mortgage rates tick up just a little bit. Not a whole lot, but just a couple basis points here and there. Um, just because the uncertainty of the election right now, and we're gonna, like, we're not gonna see any kind of major dip until we're done that, I think, yeah. because the, they just don't know who's going in the White House. It was, it was actually, it was funny when, um, when Biden was still in the race, 
the markets were all like they 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 were all Trump Trump. It was almost like okay, this is gonna be a Trump White House, and they started shifting the markets towards it. And then he out, and Harris has been you know doing what she's doing with with the election. So it's now becoming like more like okay, we don't know what's going on. These markets are pulling back a little because we're preparing for higher inflation, money printers getting turned back on. You know, with like with Trump going in because we've seen it. At least we do have the. Um, know what Trump White House is going to look like yeah. from from the uh, well, last just, term exactly and then we also know what what most like a Harris uh like White House would look like yeah. if she gets in because we we've had her as our so president all yeah. years so at least at this point we do have like two parties once the election we decide we know who's actually going in the White House we probably yeah, gonna have a quick market. shift on where the market's going that's a good way to look yeah. at it. I never thought of it like that you kind of know what both of them is and you know no matter who wins yeah. and that, you plan accordingly and you can share. Right. So, I think the rates, mortgage rates will be pretty sticky for the next, and until we hit, uh, was it November? Yeah, so yeah. Like for the next month where I don't see any kind of, any kind of real dip in the mortgage interest rates will pretty, uh, stay pretty sticky to what I mentioned earlier for, for rates until we, until we see what's happening. And then you have to make that risk assessment for yourself. Are you more interested in the lower rate? And and what ha what comes with the lower rate, right? And we talked about a little bit earlier. If the rates come down, price but the up. inventory stays low, the prices are going to go up. Yeah. If you get in now, not stretching yourself. Please don't ever go beyond your means. You may need to go to the top of your comfortable means, right? Like this is not something I would love, but I'm gonna be okay when you invite Matt over for dinner after the closing. I, you know, you're not gonna serve him ramen noodles. <laughs> like, you know, have some, some nice, nice food on on the table there. Um, but so don't go beyond your means. But what even if you maybe try to do what you need to, to get a house that yeah. you can afford today. Because yeah. if you get into a house now and the prices go down, well, no, sorry, scratch that because prices aren't coming down. Nothing, <laughs> nothing going down. Going any higher down. than what they are. If right you now. get one, if you get in a house today at the price where they are, and then as history said, history says the prices go up after an election, the prices go up. You can always refinance yeah. when the rates do come down. And now you're refinancing a lower purchase price. If you buy high refinancing, doesn't get rid of your purchase price. Right? Again, you got to be careful with the, you know, the that's, whole, that's actually yeah, a really good way to you know, go careful with the, you know, marry the house, date the thing, because again, that goes that when you go beats, right? Stay within your means yeah. that worst case scenario, you're going to be able to pay your mortgage every month. Best case scenario, the rates come down and you are in a much better place. And I, I think like, once we get past this fall, I mean, we don't, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm anticipating everyone in housing the very busy spring market next year because like we're almost kind of lining up for rates to dip into that 5% range, which I have a lot, of, I think that's such a number. Yeah. Once they see the fives, it's gonna be caught, create more of a frenzy on buyers, even open some up some, some people to list and, and that's been waiting for this to make more sense in their payment. So I, I think you guys, I think everyone here in housing is gonna be pretty busy next spring. From at least we, we saw it this year a little bit, yeah. right? Inventory yeah. is up. It's not anywhere near where it needs to be, but it's certainly up. And I think you have those people that we're gonna wait it out. Wait, <laughs> never mind. But you're gonna wait it out, right? And uh, and and they've they're sick and tired of waiting it out, yeah. right? They can't actually, you know. Not only were their kids getting bigger, but now they just had another kid yeah. or another yeah. pet or another whatever <laughs> whatever it is that that motivates you to buy a bigger house. Like you 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 don't have the option anymore. It's kind of a necessity, yeah. and so now people are going to do that. And once that gap closes between the rate they're at now and the rate they're going to get, the, the closer that gets, the more motivated they're going to be. To, uh, it's crazy how it doesn't matter what's happening and, and what people are deciding to do. Like the one factor that will not change is the price. Mm -hmm. Or at least it, it won't change, it won't go down. No. Like, you, you know, I think it, it goes to that supply and demand conversation that we continue to get back to. You go down, they, they built a lot of houses. Yeah. The market isn't as strong as it was a couple of years back because they had an influx of people and they built all the houses and now they had too many houses yeah we don't we don't have that luxury yeah. i always make fun when uh, last time i was in tampa our um, second location so my brother and then he was like let me bring you to an area where last year it was just literally just landing here and you go there and he's like 
I don't know, like more than a hundred, hundred new houses that a year prior you would you wouldn't see that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, this in Boston, at least I haven't seen yeah. such a thing. No and like, room I moved in in 2012, and for yeah. one time I could. Oh, especially around the city. I mean, there's nothing even over. Except Assembly Square. When I came here, that yeah, was that just was, part, yeah, that was just cool. that. That's pretty cool. I was <laughs> meaning to get to some volleyball in there, of course. Yeah. But, and yeah. then they just did that, that huge um, uh, American, great American beer hall oh, down I the streets. Yeah, like yeah. this huge, you know, no free advertisements for them, by the way. <laughs> yeah, this huge beer garden in that. Make sure you bleep that out. Yeah. And, you know, we can call them and say, hey, well, take the bleep out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's crazy. And popping up as houses are gone. So, well, guys, I mean, I think that the main conversation in this whole podcast, which is pretty much all of our, you don't know where the market is. You don't know all of these details. So you have to reach out to the professionals. You have to reach out to your loan officers. You have to read out, reach out to your real estate agents because they've seen everything. They know it. Also reach out to your moving companies. They know it. We do this stuff every day. Obviously the average listener that's getting into this doesn't. So it's really important to not listen to the news and not listen to TikTok or your uncle, but to call the professionals. So to wrap everything up, guys, if you were to give two, you know, let's kind of break it up. One on the buyer side, one on the seller side. What is one piece of advice that you would give the buyer and one piece of advice you would give the seller and then let both situations know how to reach both of you guys? You're, you're probably going to talk about buyers more than the Yeah, I was about to say, you probably want to say <laughs> that. So buyers are sellers. Correct. You know, yeah, yeah, most of them have to buy somewhere else. And luckily, hopefully they have enough equity where they might, uh, well, hopefully they have model loans so we, I can still work with them here. But if not, they're in a great shape being able to buy cash and they're in a good spot with that too. Um, so for buyers, definitely, again, utilize your professionals, your real estate professionals um, as soon as possible, as soon as you start thinking about it. Because we're here for you and we're not going anywhere. We're here for you either this, this fall, if you want to buy this fall, this winter, next spring market, two spring markets from now, we're here from you until you close on your home. And it's there's no cost to, to be able to get um, great advice. As you had mentioned, um, talk to your professionals and don't, don't wait for the news, don't, because the news is always two weeks behind. People will call me with like articles that they read. I'm like, that was like two weeks ago when that happened. Like, <laughs> I, don't know, news, yeah, I don't know why it's just kind of news now. So, boat, uh, higher now. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Too late to do. Oh, yeah, so that would be it. Yeah, I think in the past we've talked about um, expectations and emotions and education being kind of some some key characteristics of a, of a smooth transition uh, transaction. I think so right now, uncertainty is driving a people to sit and not know right and so the greater the certainty the greater the confidence that you have the easier it is to make a move right now um, because there's enough outside factors that you can't control that are uncertain but you don't know what you don't know so give us a call let's dig into your individual situation and that will at least maybe you maybe you land in the same spot you are at today where you're not ready to to make a move but you might be surprised and you might be in a much better situation than you thought um, my favorite story is one of my college buddies called me and was like hey we're we're gonna be thinking about buying a house um, we're not quite ready but as soon as we are let's chat and i'm like well why aren't you ready you know so we're working on our credit scores and it's like if you don't mind me asking, because I don't really need to know. Like, he needs to know. I don't really need to know. But he was a friend, and I was like, if you don't mind me asking, where are your credit scores? He goes, well, I mean, I'm in the eights, so they're okay, but Laura's only in the, you know, mid sevens. And I'm like, <laughs> dream credits. And if if you're ready, you can, we can buy a house tomorrow. <laughs> like, you're ready. But they didn't know, right? They have this, it's like the people that think 20% down is a requirement. Think, yeah. you know, a, a perfect credit score is a requirement. There are solutions. And so if you talk to Uncle Bob, he might some bad advice. But if you talk to the people that are in the business, then I think you'll, you'll find that more opportunities are here than not. Awesome. And I'm just curious if it's uh, one thing that you wish we would have asked you, what would that be? That, that would give people, I don't know, more certainty or, or whatever tip tip that, because you get all the questions uh, from your customers and maybe it's something that you haven't thought about. Ah, uh, jeez, um, yeah. Or if it's nothing, then it just means we probably asked you. Yeah, so, <laughs> here's an interesting one and I think both of would benefit from yeah. this. There was uh, another um, blog over the last couple of weeks that talked about down payment assistance things, right? 
only 13% of people who are eligible for down payment assistance actually take advantage of them. Mm. It's 87% of the people now. Now again, caveat, full disclosure, like qualifying for those down payment assistance is a smaller right. viable. It, everyone doesn't qualify for yeah. them. Um, a lot of people will and say, hey, uh, I'm a first time home buyer. It's like, yeah, but you make a money. <laughs> and you know, you're looking in some really nice spots. You're, there are time home buyer like incentives for you to take it. Maybe even if there are, maybe it's not the best path for you because of the situation you're in. But there are 87% of the people that qualify for those down payment assistance programs that could use that that extra boost, that extra help to get through the door. Uh, I'm assuming this is state by state, or is it? Yeah, state by Hampshire state or? is really it's really state by state, town town. Mm -hmm. Like there's there's lots of different opportunities yeah. there. And where should people just Google uh, down payment assistance? No, that's well, just as bad as Uncle Bob. The website, like, what, what they can go and <laughs> see it. Uh, <laughs> send me a text, and now I'll give you know, what, uh, what you qualify for for down payment assistance. <laughs> absolutely. And we'll yeah. make sure, of course, to yeah. put all the the numbers in the. Yeah. Um, uh, websites and, and URLs in the description of this episode, but Mass Housing has some great programs. So if you're in the state of Massachusetts, give me a call because I'm, I'm a lender direct, uh, I'm affiliated lender with Mass Housing, so we can definitely look at some options here. That's, yeah. That's... And I was about to ask you, like, is that your preferred method of um, contacting you? People Cell phone, call yeah, call text, call text, nights, weekends, anytime, yeah. real estate business. So we, we, we're 24 seven, as you guys know, we are not nine to five. So, <laughs> and most real estate happens after hours. So we make ourselves uh, available to answer all questions and, and be there for, for our clients. Absolutely. And yeah. then, uh, just again, to, to recap, uh, do you mind, um, seeing again, the website and your phone number for people to, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I get my email. Um, yeah, yeah email, so it's yeah. Lighthouse at CMG Home Loans. That's my email. Um, and then 605156 is my cell phone. You can call text. And then Instagram at Whitehouse more uh, at Whitehouse dot mortgage is my Instagram. So, so sure, make sure we get <laughs> all of them. Um, anything else that um, I know we kind of w went through all the questions that you guys thought. Um, we should have asked um, anyone, Paul, do uh, yeah. you want to leave the audience with any, like, any thought? Any... Especially the, the credit, any credit concerns. People might all of a sudden just think like that it's, they'll ne it'll never, ha never happen because of some mistake with credit. Utilize us as loan officers to help repair that credit too. We have a lot of resources where we can put you on a plan and on track to be able to, to buy in maybe a couple months to a year or however long it's going to take, but we'll put you in a better place and help ease a lot of that stress. Like we're consider us as aids to help you, but help put you in a better spot so you, you can, uh, so you can fulfill a buying home if that's what you want to do. So it's part two of this, yeah. part two of this yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome episode. Because I mean, that's kind of how you got into it. Everything. Yeah, that's kind of how you got into it. And I think people don't realize that like officer is there, not just to stamp it yet and then you never hear from it again, yeah. but give them the road to get to the yes, if it is a no, kind of right on the fence. So exactly. that's all it's, it's never too early to start yeah. talking to us, whether you're selling or buying, right? Because some people don't even know they have credit issues, right? That's the biggest disappointment is you, you think, I'll just go to open houses. I don't need to talk to a mortgage lender yet. And then they fall in love and then they call and they find out that some knucklehead messed up there. It, it doesn't even have to be their own fault. Yeah. Like you could have something sneak in there and now you can't qualify for what could have been your dream home and, and you're not prepared, you're not ready. And, and that's when the emotion takes effect Ooh. too. We, we want to try to just make sure it's more of a logical process where people can go into it and ease into it and be fi finally feel comfortable and confident when they are going to the open houses. Oops. Yeah. Sweet. All right, guys, this was um, a pretty, pretty packed of value episode. A lot of information. Um, Thank you guys. Thank but you I guys. still think we can do maybe after the election or a couple of weeks uh, after that, we can do a part two and a part three with credit score alone. Yeah. This, um, yeah. like, I, I feel like this is the type of episode that I really prefer um, just because it's directly kind of related to what uh, our customers can, yeah. can really Absolutely. benefit from. And of course, we cover a, a bunch of uh, other, um, but um, yeah, so anyone, um, if you guys have any specific questions about this, of course, you'll have both Matt and Ed in the show notes of this episode. Of course, you can always comment um, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening to any of the audio platforms, um, you'll be able to click the first link in the description of the episode to leave um, a recorded uh, question. 
But again, thanks a lot for being here, guys. This was an awesome uh, episode, and uh, we're looking forward to part two and three. Yeah, thank you for having us. This was great. Really appreciate it. Till next time, guys.